7 o'clock, and all's well. I want to welcome you to Lighthouse Baptist Church. And I want to give you our order of service for tonight. And I'll tell you, go ahead and grab your Bibles, if you will, and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That way, when we get into the Bible study, you'll have time to, uh, you won't be rushed, actually. So uh, what we'll do, uh, we're going to open up in a song here in just a moment. After Brother Brian leads us in a song, I'll come up and preach. After the message, we'll have another song that corresponds with the message. After that song, we'll go into our Wednesday night prayer time. I still want to take some time to pray for our leaders. Uh, I want to pray for our members of our church. We've got some members that uh, could use some urgent prayer. So we're going to take time to do that before we close off tonight. All right. It's good to have you with us. Let's go ahead and open in prayer. Father, we love you. We're, we are thankful to be in your house. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would bless this fellowship, Lord God, online. And as we gather together with just a handful of people here, we pray that your spirit, Lord, would, uh, would help us to understand your word. And may our faith be strengthened through it all. May you be glorified. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Brother Brian. Amen. Let's all sing at Calvary, hymn 334, if you have a hymnal, at Calvary. chapter 2 is where we're going to begin, and I forgot to mention something. Brother Steve, I almost changed the message on you, and the Lord wouldn't give me peace about that. I was battling, and so uh, we're sticking with the, the sermon that I'd mentioned to you earlier today. Uh, something else I want to make known to everybody is if you have prayer requests that you'd like to send in, you can email us, text us, call us. Uh, Lord willing, we weren't as prepared this evening as the Lord willing will be be prepared for next week if we still have to do this, but uh, we'll set it up to where you can get these uh, turned into us, maybe even during the service. If you've got a prayer request, you want to text it to, to one of our staff members, and then when we come to prayer time, we'll make sure we add you to the list and pray for you, okay? Uh, it's good to have you with us, though. Uh, Second Thessalonians, the other day as I was uh, praying about what to preach, I was actually going through some old sermon titles because I want to feel comfortable as I'm doing this. It's a little difficult for me to preach to five or six people. 
uh, and looking on a, a camera and preaching into a camera. So I'm still getting used to that. And so as I was browsing through some sermons that have ministered to my heart in the past, there was a title that uh, grabbed my attention, and that is Not Easily Shaken. And if you'll look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, we're going to begin a reading here in, uh, in verse 1. We'll read to verse 5. And let me give you a little bit of the background before I begin reading, okay? This uh, little epistle was written shortly after 1 Thessalonians. The Apostle Paul was in Corinth, and he had sent this 1 Thessalonians uh, to the Thessalonians. And uh, the messenger came back fairly quick. He hadn't spent a whole lot of time in Thessalonica, maybe a couple months at most. He hustled back and he told Paul all that was transpiring. The people in Thessalonica, the Christians in Thessalonica, were struggling with their faith. There was a, there was a lot of trouble. And we're going to read that in the scripture. We don't know all the details. We don't know the type of persecution they were experiencing. But some of them had thought that... Uh, Christ was coming immediately. They, they thought they may have missed the rapture and they thought that they were in the tribulation and that the, the end of days was coming, the day of Christ. And so Paul had to clear some things up here for them, okay? They had made, some of them had made some really drastic decisions. So let's read this, verses one through five. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth all who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. So Paul has to remind them of some things they've forgotten. They have been shaken, and he's going to deal with that issue. I'm going to deal with that issue, how to not be easily shaken, okay? So let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Once again, we pray that you would bless this message and help us, Lord, to be good listeners. Uh, we praise you and thank you for the truth you've revealed to us, for the word of God that's available to us. And may you give us understanding now, and may you help us to see how we can make application to our own lives. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's look at a couple things here. Let's look at chapter one as we consider, uh, first of all, the reason in verse six and verse seven. Notice what Paul says. This is kind of the introductory uh, comments to the letter. All of chapter 1 is. In verse 6 and verse 7, he says this. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So Paul knows that they are they're experiencing some trouble. We don't know if it's civic trouble. We don't know if it's uh, religious trouble uh, from the different pagan worshipers that are there, or maybe even some of the Jews who had not uh, accepted or embraced Christianity. They're actually opponents to it. Uh, we don't know exactly who it's coming from or what's taking place, but it's very, very difficult and to the point where Paul had to write this letter quickly because their faith was being shaken. Now, here's a reality. The fact of the matter is, everybody that lives in these mortal bodies gets shook now and then. There are going to be things that come to your life that are going to shake you up. Uh, John the Baptist would ask Jesus through a messenger, Art thou he or do we look for another? Sounds like a man who, who was struggling with his faith a little bit. Now, Jesus immediately after that messenger came to him and... Uh, Asked the question for, for John, Jesus said about John, there's none greater than John the Baptist. So if a man like John could have his faith shook, so can you and so can I. And by the way, sometimes it's not just trouble that shakes a person's faith. Sometimes it's just worldly pleasure. You know, people can have their faith shook in the times of ease as well as in the times of trouble. 
Now, I realize in the context that we're reading this and studying this, it was trouble that was shaking their faith, okay? Brought on some questions. But we need to understand that, and some of you may already know that peer pressure, peer pressure can shake your faith. Remember Peter, as he was warming himself by the fire at the trial of the Lord Jesus? Uh, it's interesting, the scripture clarifies that a little maiden, two, two ladies had asked Peter, Aren't, weren't you with Jesus? Oh, not me, not me. And he cursed and denied. There's a man that had his faith shook. And I'm telling you, it's so important that you and I, that know Christ as our Savior, develop some stability in the faith. Because the reality is this, there are people that are watching you. I know in my life personally, uh, you know, when I first made a decision to live out and out for the Lord Jesus Christ, some people, some people would listen to me, but it took about a year before I was actually able to see a, a convert uh, with some old friends and then some family. And then it took a few years after that, there were other people that I at least was able to talk to and years and years have expired. And I still have family, mer family, family members and old uh, high school friends that I, I know they're probably still watching, wondering when old Merv's going to mess up. And listen, I could, I know I could, but I am what I am by the grace of God. But I'll tell you this, uh, if you're saved and you know Christ is your savior, your people are watching you. The people you work with, your family, friends, even your enemies are watching to see if what you have is real. And just on a side note, before I even go on with this, I want you to consider Moses. You remember the story of Moses as he was on the backside of the desert living as a shepherd. He'd already fled Egypt. And you know how God spoke to him? God spoke to him through the burning bush. But a, a bush being lit on fire in that arid uh, climate, that wasn't unusual. What was unusual was uh, that bush kept on burning. Moses noticed that it was on fire, but it was the fact that it continued to burn without dissolving. OK, without going to ashes that got Moses attention. He said, I'll turn aside and see this great sight. So he turns aside and he takes a look and then God speaks to him. And you as a Christian, listen, if you can stay faithful, if you can be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord when it's difficult and when everything's going well, because sometimes church attendance is at its lowest when everybody's comfortable. And sometimes church attendance can be at its highest when there are tough times. And I realize with what we're going through right now calls for a different uh, uh, route of uh, ministry for us. But there is a reality to having an unshakable faith. And let's see if, we, see if we can learn some principles here from Paul. Let's look at some of the results of, of uh, their faith being shook here in Thessalonica, okay? First of all, verse 2 of chapter 2. Verse 2 of chapter 2, Paul says this. He says that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter. Uh, apparently, there were some uh, people, there were some documents, there was some influence that had made its way to the hearts of some of these believers. And it had shook them up to the degree that some of them were parting from the faith. Now, Paul's going to mention this parting from the faith, this great falling away in verse 3. Uh, he mentions it. It's the apostasy. It's, it's, it's what's going to be prevalent in the church before Jesus returns. There's going to be a great falling away. And by the way, you can't fall away from something that you weren't near at one time. So he's talking about those who are embracing the gospel of Jesus Christ, those who are holding fast to the truth. There's going to be a lot of them that fall away. And so Paul was telling them, listen, listen, I don't want you to be soon shaken because the reality is Christ hasn't come yet. And the reality is this is not that day of Christ, that day of judgment uh, where Antichrist is exposed and he's the world leader. This is not that time yet. And he's trying to remind them of things they forgot. But this is what's going on in them. Something else that's interesting. Uh, we notice in chapter 3, if you look down at verse 7, verse 7. Actually, verse 6 and 7, the Bible says this. Now we commend you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother. Now that's significant. Paul is, Paul is calling out the brethren, believers, who are 
a bad influence, who are literally, because of the circumstances, drawing people away from the faith, shaking up their faith. You know, listen, Christian, uh, that's the last thing you need to do is be a discouragement to another brother or sister in Christ. And friend, I'm telling you, uh, like attracts like. And so we need to be careful that uh, we don't give ear to all the negative news out there, okay? I realize we got to be, we can't live with our head in the sand when it comes to the what's going on in our country, in our, in our uh, uh, state and all of that, and of course in our church. But we need to be focused on Jesus. Paul's pointing out some people and pointing out a fact that people have been influenced in a wrong way by the wrong crowd. Verse 7, he says, For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. So Paul is contrasting, he's reminding them of the way he lived the Christian life amongst them and the principles of Christianity. And uh, he's reminding them that I heard that there are those amongst you who are not abiding by these principles that honor Christ, that are becoming of a Christian. He says, you need, to, you need to remove yourself from them. And so uh, that's taken place, all right? Something else has taken place. In verse 11, we notice that some people apparently had quit, decided to quit working. They, uh, they were under the impression that Jesus was going to come any day. And in their mindset, they thought, well, what's the sense? Let's just eat, drink, and be merry, so to speak. And they quit working. Verse 11, Paul says this, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. <laughs> and by the way, there's a great principle there. When you're not busy about doing that which is good, which is right, it's real easy for your mouth to get busy about things that are wrong. And so Paul's given some principles here. He's reminding them. He's revealing to you, you and I the result of being shaken in the faith. All right, because when we are stable in the faith, listen, we're going to keep our thinking right. We're going to keep our mouth right. And so uh, Paul, Paul's given us these principles. Now I want to hustle through this. I feel like I'm going pretty fast already. But once again, uh, the importance, the importance of developing a, a solid faith. The word uh, shaken there in verse uh, verse two uh, chapter 2, it means to be unloosed or uh, uh, loosened, uh, untied. And um, Paul has this mindset of the people of God, the church in Thessalonica, uh, un unloosening their moorings that fasten them to Jesus Christ. They were starting to drift. And so that's what, it had, that's what he's talking about when he's talking about being shaken. I realize we can be shaken emotionally, we can be shaken mentally, but we can still hold fast to the truth. The Bible even tells us that Jesus at one time was troubled in his spirit, okay? So that isn't sin to feel emotionally shook and things like that. That's not sin. What we want to be careful of is that we don't just start drifting from the word of God and and allowing those questions, because what has happened is uh, they're questioning the authority of Paul. Paul's authority was being questioned. He was apostle. He was a man who, who spoke the word of God. He was a man filled with the spirit of God who spoke the word of God. And so uh, his authority is being questioned, and that would be the equivalent today of you and I questioning the word of God. And I tell you, that is one of the devil's greatest tools. He hasn't had to change his tactics. That worked in Genesis chapter 3 when he said to Eve, Hath God said? And it still works today. If he can just get you to question. It, 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 how, where's God in all of this? Where's God in all the problems in society? And listen, the reality is this. There is a reality, and I, I don't want to make light of anybody that's struggling and suffering right now at all. I don't want to make light of that at all, but I, there's a reality, reality. Listen, there have been generations that have had a whole lot worse conditions than you and I have. A whole lot worse. And I just, just as out of a side note, I did a little research on the 1918 Spanish flu, just for those of you that were watching and you here. I, I challenge you to take a look into that. In our country, in our country, 
I, they had to quarantine, they asked cities to quarantine business themselves, to have the people quarantine themselves, shut down businesses, shut down churches back then for not, not just a couple weeks, but a couple months. And the cities that did that fared the best. They came out of it the quickest. So this isn't something new. It's a fascinating little uh, history report if you're, if you're interested. Now, let me give you some, the remedy to uh, uh, stabilizing yourself, okay? I'll try to keep it simple. James 1, verse 8, the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. I'll tell you, the first thing you need to do is make up your mind that God's in control. You need to make up your mind about who you are in Jesus. You need to make up your mind about where you stand for Christ. You need to, Elijah would say to King Ahab and all of the people of Israel, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. And I'm telling you, that's a problem today. And when a Christian is unstable about what he believes, he'll be unstable in all other areas. Make up your mind. Make up your mind. That's the first thing you got to do. The second thing is this. Feed your faith. Feed your faith. Now, Zig Ziglar used to talk about feeding your motivation. And there, there's a lot of sense to that, a lot of common sense to that. But, you know, it's interesting. I use that term, feed your faith, for this reason. Matthew 4, 4, G Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Father. So God's telling us we're to nourish ourselves on his word, not just through the preacher, but through our own reading. And I mean, you can listen to the word of God. And right now, while many of you are at home, you're cooped up inside, you don't have the liberty to get out like you'd like to. What a great time to get more involved in the word, in the word of God. But some of you could probably read through it during the duration that you're out of church, okay? But I want to challenge you to feed your faith. Job said this in Job 23, 12. Job said, and by the way, when Job said this, this was something he had practiced before the trouble came. Before Job had lost his family, before Job had lost his, his wealth, before Job had lost his health. Job said, I have esteemed his words more than my necessary food. When you make God's word that important, friend, it'll stabilize you. It will stabilize you. I don't know, I used to... Uh, live in the country and as a kid we I and a friend of mine Warren Jeanette and Warren if you're out there good to see you um, we would wander through the back uh, yard my dad had about 14 acres and there, there was another 20 acres between my house and his house and there were old fence posts out there and we'd go out there and we'd grab those things and pull those out I mean we were only eight nine ten years old and uh, we'd use them as swords sometimes, those old metal fence posts that they put the barbed wire on. Uh, the wooden ones, most of them had decayed. But <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is what Paul's concerned about. He's concerned about our fence posts of faith becoming so loose that anybody can pull it out. Mm -hmm. And we need to put some mortar in there, and I'm telling you, the Word of God will do that. Something else, though. I said, uh, make up your mind, feed your faith. And this sounds so simple, but this is the truth. Well, Bob Jones Sr. preached a sermon called Do Right. Do right. Do right till the stars fall, he'd say. And the reality is this. The more you just do what is right, just do what is right. I'm telling you, it makes your heart sensitive. Some of you, you might be just you're just getting right with the Lord and you still got some calluses there. Maybe there's some of you out there that are, you don't have that sensitivity to the things of God that you used to. And that's a dangerous spot. Here's what I've discovered. As you just obey and just do what you're supposed to do, it's like, take, it's like God just takes a, a, a razor and peels the calluses off your heart. And the more you do right, the more difficult, the more difficult it is to do wrong. The more you abstain from uh, the wrong programs, the more difficult it's going to be to watch a wrong program. The more you abstain from alcohol, the more difficult it will be to partake of it. I'm not saying that you couldn't fall into sin, but I'm telling you it's going to affect you more deeply. Do right. Do right. I want to turn to Hebrews chapter 12 as we get ready to close. 
Hebrews chapter 12. Well, the sermon goes a lot quicker when I'm not talking to a whole lot of people. Well, at least that I know of. Hebrews 12. We're going to look at verse 25. And verses 25 through verse 29, uh, these scriptures are in reference to the word of God, okay? And so listen closely. Hebrews 12, 25. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. I'm going to pause there and just make this emphasis. Sometimes God brings these troubles into people's lives, into your life, into my life, and even to the people of Thessalonica, to help us see where we've really planted ourselves. To help us see if we're really on stable ground. Now, out boating with my son-in-law uh, about two weeks ago, uh, we pulled up to a, a particular pier to go to a restaurant. And there's one thing about it, when you're getting off the boat onto the pier, um, you want to make sure you immediately put yourself on the pier if the boat is not fastened in. Or you'll be doing a serious case of the splits. <laughs> and so uh, you get up off the boat just as quick as possible to get on stable ground. Now the reality is this. When trouble comes your way and my way, it reveals things about us. It does. And maybe if the red flag is up in your life right now and you, you're feeling just distraught and confused and you have questions about what... And maybe you're... God forbid, but maybe you're even questioning God. Let me just tell you, let that be a time for you to at least give ear to the word of God. Go back to his word. Read his word. Obviously, listen, listen, if you put your money in, in the stock market, if you put your money in your employer, if you put your money even in your friends, listen, we're all shakable. <laughs> we're all shakable, but the one person that's not is the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, we got a song. I'm going to have Brother Brian come up here and sing it in just a moment. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all the other ground is sinking sand. You know, uh, I was thinking about the San Francisco earthquake, uh, the most recent one, and a, a news reporter that was in a helicopter uh, looking at the chaos. And from the view of the helicopter, they could see the city shook up and uh, they could see the buildings, uh, some of them uh, falling apart, imploding even. Uh, and yet the whole time she was up there, though she felt the sadness for what was going on down there, she, she said, I couldn't feel it at all up here in the plane or in the helicopter. I knew I was in a safe place. And I know, I know there are elements that can shake up a helicopter, but there's a truth there. When you turn your eyes upon Jesus, when you set your affection on things that are above, I'm telling you, he'll lift you up above the problems of this world, okay? And so let's go ahead and get ready to sing this song uh, on Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. Amen. Let's all sing the Solid Rock, hymn 264, if you have a hymnal. Hey, hey. 
All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other have a closing word of prayer, but we're going to pray for some members and some people that had uh, been added to our prayer list here. I won't go through the whole prayer list at this time, but uh, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer together. Father, we uh, ask that you would uh, be with us as we take a few moments to seek your face and trust you to minister to people and help people. I think of Cleo Yarber. I pray for his health. I pray, Father, as he is on hospice care. And Father, he knows that uh, uh, his time to meet you is drawing nigh. And uh, Lord, I'm thankful that he's put his faith in you. I pray that you'd give him grace and comfort, comfort his family. We certainly would pray for a miracle. We'd rejoice in a miracle if you gave him even more time. But in the meantime, give him grace. Give uh, Rodney Step grace. We pray for his health, he and his wife, Sheena. We pray, Lord, for Brother Steve Wilhoy. I'm glad, Lord, that uh, the procedure uh, went well this Monday. And, Lord, I pray that he recovers well from the three stents that uh, he's received. I pray, Father, that uh, you just take care of Debbie as well, meet their needs, bless their family. And, Lord, I pray for our elected officials. I pray that you'd give them wisdom to make decisions that would protect and promote our Christian liberties. Uh, I pray, Father, that you'd give them wisdom to make decisions that would protect Israel and protect our borders. Give them courage to make these decisions. And when they do, keep them safe. I pray for President Donald Trump. I pray for Vice President Mike Pence. I pray for, <clears throat> I pray for Kellyanne Conway and Sarah Huckabee Sanders, Newt, Newt Gingrich, and Rudy Giuliani. I pray for Dr. Ben Carson. I pray for uh, Newt Gingrich, and I pray for Ted Cruz, and Rick Perry, and Rand Paul, and Paul Ryan, and Marco Rubio, and Mike Huckabee, and Scott Walker, and Rick Santorum, Tony Scott, and Rick Scott, and Mitch McConnell. I pray, Father, for Attorney General Barr and General Mattis, help them. I pray for our Supreme Court justices, help Clarence Thomas, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, help Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh, help John Roberts, Help uh, Samuel Alito and Sonia Sotomayor. Help Stephen Breyer, Alina Kagan. And Lord, I pray for our state and local officials, Todd Young, Eric Holcomb, Steve Boyer, Brian Bosma, Phil Boots, Todd Rakita, Senator Delph, Tim Brown, uh, Mike Braun. Help Mike Nielsen and Matt Gentry. And Father, we pray for Chad Morgan and Tyson Warmoth, Brad Bailey and Tony Bales. Lord, I know some of these are not in the office that they once held, but I, they still hold influence. And I pray you, that you just help them, encourage them all. We love you. We praise you. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.